so it's certainly a, a great honor uh, for me to be here and be able to talk at Joe's uh, birthday meeting. And so indeed, before I start, I wanted to say two things about, uh, about Joe. Um, one was that I, I first met Joe, and I'm really just going to echo things that have been said many times already in the last uh, couple of days. So I first met Joe when I was, I guess, in my second year of my PhD at a school in Kajes. And there was a talk which somebody was giving, I forget who. And at the end, I asked a question. It was about the landscape, I think, the talk. And the question wasn't that well articulated. I you know, didn't really know what I was asking, I guess. And the, the speaker gave me an answer that was more or less orthogonal to not really related to what I was asking at all. And then a few hours later, over dinner, um, Joe actually comes and, and says to me, you know, I think you asked a question in this talk that wasn't answered. And, you know, and then he actually, in fact, answered this question. And I think that was definitely beyond the call of duty of listening uh, to somebody who certainly you know, wasn't anybody he had any reason to listen to. Um, and I think that's a theme that many people have echoed, that, that Joe really listens better than anybody else in the field that I know. I don't know anybody else who you can go into his office with a totally random question that's not related to anything he's worked on or, well, has published papers on. <laughs> or, and it's certainly not related to what he's working on at the moment. And if you do that with most senior people, within a couple of minutes you get a lecture about whatever they happen to be thinking about at that moment. <laughs> but with, uh, with, with Joe, you're actually likely to get an answer to the question that you asked. And I think that's a, a really unique thing. And that's why I guess he's uh, dear to a lot of us uh, here. Okay, that was one. And the second point is uh, has to do with condensed matter and um, high energy uh, theory. And you know, I guess for the first 25 years of my life, I was certainly in line with what uh, Nima eloquently expressed uh, yesterday, that you know, not giving a damn about metals. Um, now, it's not that I wouldn't say that Joe converted me. That's not quite quite how it went. Um, so what was important was this paper by, to me at least, one of the things was this paper, this beautiful paper by Son and Steranets on the shear viscosity of entropy being one over four pi in a big class of theories. And so what that seemed to do, um, it sort of suggested the possibility that this quantity, eta over s, the sort of very vulgar, banal quantity of viscosity that you know makes you think of honey more than more than particle physics, might play a fundamental role both for black holes but also for you know, actual plasmas that you could make in a lab. And it, this seemed like the sort of, it captured an anti-reductionist ideal that maybe you know, fundamental and non-fundamental physics were not so different as we sometimes uh, like to assume. Okay? And I think this idea that it doesn't have to be you know, beautiful mathematical objects like you know, twisted indices or derived categories or calibrated submanifolds of G2 manifolds that I thought about in my PhD, um, that you know, there might be fundamental physics that wasn't phrased in terms of those quantities, but in something as stupid as the viscosity, right? And so, you know, that was great. And then over the years, I've been working on, on, with that ideal, right? That somehow dirty things and fundamental things might not be so different. But occasionally, of course, you wake up in the morning and say, well, clearly I should be working on, you know, twisters and getting away with space time and, and things that are more obviously fundamental. And in those moments, it's sort of a consolation to know that Joe, took time out of you know, discovering deep brains and other important things to write two totally seminal papers about interacting fermions. And I, you know, these, fortunately, uh, Shamit and um, Matthew already mentioned these papers, so I can go quickly. But these are two absolutely seminal papers. This is Joe teaching himself Fermi liquid theory and thereby explaining it to the rest of us in a way that we can understand. And this was Joe grappling with problems that have are still, as, as was clear in Shamit's talk, not, not totally understood. And so, you know, if it's good enough for Joe to work on, then it's uh, good enough for me. Okay. So in this talk, I want to talk about two things. Um, one is going to be that they're related. Uh, one is going to be a short and very simple story that's meant to be, I hope, to offer a sort of prototype of how we can connect ideas from ADS-CFT to, to experiments. And the sort of ideal I want to show here is that if you want to make that connection, it really has to be very, very simple. Because obviously, you know, n equals 4 is not the microscopic theory of any, any existing material. And so it's not obvious what the strategy is. Okay? It's not the traditional physics strategy. It's about extracting very, very simple lessons that you can then go and apply, hopefully insightfully, in a different context. So I want to tell the story of that nature. And the second one is going to be some recent work on, on disorder. 
Okay. So coherent metals. So metals have have uh, conductivities and they have Judah peaks. And so Judah peak means that if you plot the dissipative part of the conductivity against the frequency, you see a bump like that. So this is a measure. This dissipative conductivity measures how much heat you generate if you run an alternating current with frequency omega through the material. It's a measure of how many degrees of freedom there are in the material. The overlap of the current operator is a function of frequency. So I want to consider the case. I want to call a coherent metal the case where there's a really sharp, so this is called a Judah peak, and I want that to be a clean separation of scales, meaning that the width of the Judah peak is much shorter than the, uh, so that's a decay rate, it's, a, it's an energy, uh, much shorter than the UV scale of the system, which is this E Fermi or the electron volt, or as Shamit said, the Planck scale. Okay, so assume there is a hierarchy of scales and that your optical conductivity is called looks like this. This is the case in many, many materials. So how did it get that way? Well, there are, two, there are two ways that can happen. So what this peak, let me go back, what this peak is really telling you is that there's a long-lived something in the system. Okay, that's the inverse lifetime. And if that's small, the lifetime's long, and so it's, the system contains some long-lived excitation uh, that lives much longer than the UV scale. So the natural way that happens, the way that happens in you know, copper or lead or any other material that you're likely to read about in an undergrad textbook is because in a Fermi liquid, the low energy interactions are weak. Okay? And then you have quasi-particles. And this is why we can think of conduction in copper as just billiard balls flowing down, the, flowing down the metal. That isn't the UV description, but that's the effective IR description. So because low energy interactions are weak, there are quasi-particles. And because there are quasi-particles, okay, a quasi-particle just means a field that's almost free. There are actually infinitely many long-lived quantities. If the field was exactly free, they'd be exactly non-interacting, right? So every, you can create a, this is like a, psi dagger k, psi k, right? It creates an excitation with momentum k. These, do, these are uncoupled if it's free, and so if you create them, they just go, right? So the reason that there are Judah peaks in conventional metals is because the interactions are very weak at low energies, so there are very long-lived excitations. However, there's another possibility that is not, in fact, has not really been discussed in condensed matter physics, which is the interactions are strong, so there are no quasi-particles, but due to a kinematic reason, momentum, for example, the total momentum is a long-lived quantity. And that can happen even if the interactions are strong, but translation variance is only weakly broken. Okay, so if, in the, if translation variance is exact, the momentum is exactly conserved, and then this peak will be a delta function. If interactions are strong, but your coupling to disorder or to a lattice is weak, you can get a situation where there are no quasi-particles, but momentum relaxes slowly. Okay, so this is only possible at strong coupling. Okay, if your theory of low energy is weakly coupled, this is not what happens. That's what happens, okay? Very good. So when you have quasi-particles, then you, you have to keep track of all these delta nk's, right? the excitations of every momentum. There's an equation that does that, and that's called the Boltzmann equation. And you find that in lots of textbooks. There are decades of studies, and we know how to solve that, okay? When the transport's only controlled by momentum, you could give that a name, too. That's essentially a hydrodynamic regime, okay? It's when almost conserved quantities dominating everything, except it's not conventional hydrodynamics, because here we're imagining that we're effectively at zero temperature, okay? So it's not thermal interactions that are averaging everything. It's a, it's a statement about field theory and irrelevant couplings. So the translation symmetry breaking has a small effect. So if you want to keep track of just momentum, there's a formalism that does that that goes back to the 60s, which is called uh, the memory matrix formalism, which I don't have time to go through, but it gives you a formula for the connectivity that looks like this. So this is the pole, right, that has the width, and this is the weight of the, of the peak, the, the, that peak, right? Due to peak has a weight, a spectral weight, which is this. And so this memory matrix formalism gives you a formula for the spectral weight in terms of some susceptibility. So chi pj is just a two-point function of the momentum, total momentum and the total current. It makes sense, it's the overlap. So the idea is you set up a current, you start with a j, it decays immediately to everything except the momentum, the momentum carries along, and then because the conductivity is a current, current two-point function, you have to convert it back to current at the end. So you get a jp, Pj. It turns out it's symmetric. There's something called the Onsiger type relations, so that's why you get this chi Pj squared. Even better, this memory matrix gives you a formula for the lifetime. Okay, so this is the lifetime, the width of the Judah peak, which is given in terms of the two-point function of some operator O. Okay, so the two-point function of O. So let, let me say what O is. So O is the operator that has a translation symmetry breaking coupling. Right? So normally in quantum field theory, certainly in high energy physics, 
you think about, you know, the couplings don't depend on space, right? Okay, now, something that breaks translation variance is when you have a coupling that depends on space, and that coupling will couple to some particular operator, let's call it O. So that first line describes a Hamiltonian of some system coupled to an operator with a space-dependent coupling, okay? For the case of disorder, so for lattice, this V would be some periodic potential. For disorder, this V is something that you draw from a random distribution, okay? And you have to keep drawing it from lots of distributions and then average your results. So just to give a quick outline of where, why it might be reasonable that a two-point function of this operator appears multiplied by this K squared. So not, this is like not even an outline, but a key step is clearly what you care about is the momentum relaxation rate, okay? So the momentum relaxation rate is measured by P dot, the rate of change of momentum. As you know from quantum mechanics, P dot is the commutator of H with P, which is minus the commutator of P with H. But P with H is how the Hamiltonian changes under a translation, okay? So it's the gradient of the Hamiltonian. And the gradient of the Hamiltonian essentially picks out this coupling V. So that's why you get a grad V squared times OO, right? And that's what I wrote here. There's a V squared, that's the grad, and that's the O. Okay, the integrals, the rest is sort of dressing, which you have to, you know, massage a little bit, but that's the essence of why it amounts to calculating a two-point function. So details of these steps you can find in, uh, which were really just adapted from papers from the 60s, but this, you can read about it in that paper. Okay, now, the reason this is important is that if you have a holographic system, so which I'm not really going to explain, I don't have time to explain how it works, but you take your favorite holographic theory, you put it at finite charge density, okay, and then you run a current through it, okay? In all holographic theories, there are no quasi-particles, okay? That, that's the whole point. It's, it's strongly interacting. That's why there's a weakly coupled gravity dual. So in all holographic theories, transport, sorry, that have a Druda peak, okay? There's some that not only interaction is strong, but momentum relaxation is also strong, okay? That, that's more complicated. I'm not going to talk about it uh, in the first half of this talk. But say you have a Druda peak. That Druda peak in holography is always controlled by momentum relaxation, not by the relaxation of infinitely many quasi-particles, okay? And so in the next five minutes, I'm going to show you this has an order one effect that, that, that predicts something, okay? And so if you want to describe some metal, if you want to get this linear and T resistivity from a holographic metal, uh, it better also satisfy this thing I'm about to show you. Okay. So this has to do with something, okay, so I want to make a statement now about these metals where the conductivity is controlled only by momentum relaxation, not by these infinitely many long-lived uh, delta Ns. So this relates to something called the thermal conductivity. So the thermal conductivity is you set up a heat temperature gradient and you measure how quickly energy gets transported from one side to the other. So in a Fermi liquid, in a conventional metal, there's something called the Wittemann Franz law that says that this quantity L, which is the thermal conductivity divided by the electrical conductivity, is some constant, pi squared over three, okay? This pi squared over three comes from certain integrals of the Fermi Dirac distribution. It manifestly has to do with quasi-particles, okay? Um, I'm gonna, I don't think I'm gonna have time to say when this holds, but what you need is long-lived quasi-particles -part, long quasi and elastic scattering. Elastic scattering is very reasonable because you're trying to relate heat transport and electric transport. And if you scatter elastically, you lose energy as well as momentum. And that means that heat will degrade at a different rate to current because you lose energy that degrades heat more quickly. So if you want to relate, if you want to have any hope of relating heat and electric current, the scattering had better be elastic, okay? And in a conventional metal, it turns out that elastic scattering happens in two regimes at very low temperature and also possibly surprisingly at quite high temperature, but I don't have time to tell you about that. So there's been a lot of interest in the last 10 years because this vitamin franz law is a very robust feature of Fermi liquids, a lot of experimental effort has gone in to measuring this in unconventional materials, which I don't have time to tell you about. But the way that most of these experiments are interpreted is that two things can happen. You measure this ratio, and it's bigger than the expected amount, or it's less. Okay. If it's bigger, that tells you that heat conductivity is more efficient than electrical conductivity. How can that happen? That can only happen if there's some neutral, there's some extra emergent degrees of freedom that are neutral that carry heat but don't carry charge. So if L is bigger than L0, it's a diagnostic for something fancy like spin on Fermi surfaces or something like that. Whilst if L is less than L0, it tells you that the heat current's getting degraded more quickly than the electric current, which means that your scattering is inelastic. Okay, that's the way all the, the, the whole bunch of papers and they're all, this is the framework, this is the mental framework in which they're interacting. Now, if you don't have quasi-particles from the outset, 
this pi squared over 3 just doesn't mean anything. And it's not a valid reference point. Okay, This is a trivial point, but uh, well, it's also important. Okay, So now let me tell you what happens. Just bear with me for one minute. So I'm going to try to tell you what happens to this ratio in this case where momentum relaxation controls everything. So I'd rather make a statement that applies to all holographic metals. Okay, All right. So from the formula I gave you before, we can see what the electrical conductivity, I just put omega equals 0 in the formula I had before. That's the DC conductivity. And so that's this ratio of susceptibilities times 1 over gamma. I could also measure, I could, there's a similar formula for the heat current. What you have to do, that's kappa. And so J gets replaced by Q. So instead of the electrical current, you have the heat current, Q. Okay, that's the rate at which, it's the energy current, basically. That's called kappa bar. And then there's a T, this factor, t, these factors of T are because somebody in the 18th century, you know, mystifying the heat conductivity. Okay. Um, all right. And then alpha is what's called the thermoelectric conductivity. That's if you apply an electric field and you measure how much heat current you get. Or you apply a heat gradient and you measure how much electric current you get. It's like the off-diagonal mode. And so there, you start with the heat current, you convert it to momentum, and then the momentum, you have to convert it back to electric current. Okay? So hopefully those formula are obvious. Now, there's a bar on this kappa, and that's because this is not what is normally called the heat conductivity by an experimentalist. And that's because, for a quantum field theorist, the natural way to think about it is like this. You have two sources, E and grad T, electric field thermal gradient, and you have two responses, the heat current and the electric current, and there's some matrix, which is just Green's functions, okay, that relate them. However, experimentally, you have your system, you have your sample, and you apply a heat, let's say you want to measure the thermal conductivity, you apply a heat gradient, but you don't have an extra lead that's closing the circuit. And so current, electric current can't flow because it's, a, it's an open circuit. It's not a closed circuit. Okay? So while a theorist might want to measure the heat conductivity with E equals 0, experimentally the heat current is measured with J equals 0. Okay? That's, just, that's just the way it is. And so by just moving this matrix around, you can get that the real kappa that's actually measured is this kappa bar minus some thermoelectric thing, okay? It just comes from measuring. You write Q is kappa grad T, and then you can do that with E equals 0 or J equals 0, and they're just related in that way, okay? So now if you plug in these formulae that I have for the connectivities into this formula, you see you basically they all cancel, and you get 0, okay? So this Lorentz ratio is tiny. Effectively, you know, it's not 0, obviously, but it's very small. So what happened? It's very simple, okay? We had these open circuit boundary conditions that say that current can't flow, but current certainly carries momentum. So if you kill the current, you also kill the momentum. But momentum was the only long-lived quantity in the game. So if you measure the thermal conductivity with boundary conditions that kill the momentum, the thermal current just degrades really, really quickly. Okay? And so the thermal current with these open circuit boundary conditions is very small. And this leads to this L, this Lorentz ratio, being much, much less than 1. I'm not sure how many kinetic theorists in the room, so I'm going to skip uh, this slide. Okay, so it's a totally robust. S is the thermal power. It's um, it's alpha squared over sigma or something like that. It's, uh, it's a very important experimental quantity. Okay. Um, so, so okay. Anyway, so it's a robust feature of metals that are strongly interacting, but weak, but in which translation variance is only weakly broken. That this L has to be less than one. Okay. So are there any, this is something that one should look for. And so you want to go around and ask, what metals have Druder peaks but are strong candidates for not having a quasi-particle description? Okay. Because, you know, a Druder peak in itself is, you know, copper has a Druder peak, that's fine. So you look around and, um, you know, you see these papers and almost all, they often have little bumps at low frequency, but does that count as a Druder peak or not? It's a bit tricky. So this paper, which is by the group of Basov et al. at uh, UCSD, they have a plot of this vanadium dioxide, which is actually very interesting. It has a metal insulator transition, which I won't talk about. But so this, this, red, this red line, or pink line, is the thermal conductivity in a metallic, sorry, the electrical conductivity in a metallic phase. It looks like a decent Druda peak. And they have this statement, so these are the experimentalists speaking, not, not me. The coherent part of the conductivity, the Druda peak, persists beyond something called the yacht regal uh, yoffi regal mott limit, which is believed to be a regime where you cannot have descriptions by quasi-particles. Um, yeah, I think I don't have time to say anything about that. So they claim to have a material 
with a Judah peak and without quasi particles. Okay, so could we measure the thermal conductivity in this material? Now, thermal conductivity is very tricky because this, this ratio is the electronic contribution to the thermal conductivity. Phonons also carry heat, you know, um, and uh, so you need to subtract them off somehow if you want to access electronic, especially at high temperatures, okay? So it turns out this material, because it has a metal insulator transition, you actually have a way of doing that, which I'm afraid I, don't, I can't tell you about. But so there's some first, forthcoming uh, experiment by a group at Berkeley uh, that have in fact measured the thermal conductivity in this material, uh, this sample, and they seem to have found um, that, that L is much less than one, okay? Which would be pretty cool uh, if it's true. So there, this, is not out, this paper is not out because it's really subtle. Subtracting the phonons is a non-trivial thing and they want to check that they've done it right, okay? But what, what I'm trying to get across is that if you take a very simple lesson about strong coupling, which was arrived at through, through holographic studies, okay? Uh, you get a very sharp possibility and you know, this possibility may even get realized, which would be, which would be a great thing, okay? All right, so with that, that was story one. And so now I'm gonna change you a little bit, but I still wanna talk about translation invariance breaking. So I mentioned disorder as something that breaks translation invariance. And um, what I'm about to say now is some work with uh, Joe Santos, um, who's a postdoc who was here uh, and is now, now in Stanford. Um, so I, I mentioned before this coupling. To, so you imagine you have some operator and you couple it to a spatially dependent coupling that is, that is random, okay? You draw it from some distribution. So the case I talked about before was when this coupling is irrelevant, okay? That means the effects of disorder were weak so that we had this really nice sharp Judah peak, uh, you know, in the connectivity. In fact, there's this very simple criterion for when disorder is relevant or irrelevant, and it's just a generalization of the usual dimensional analysis that you do for a coupling, okay? You have a cup, you know, you have a operator in some dimension O, you get its coupling H, if it has a positive mass dimension, it's relevant, if it's not, it's irrelevant. There's a trivial generalization that would take you two minutes that I don't have that tell you that when you have a disordered coupling, this coupling is relevant if the dimension delta of the, of the, uh, of the sorry, it's irrelevant if the dimension delta of the operator is bigger than a certain amount, okay? It's not exactly the same as your conventional power counting, but it's, it's, it's trivial, okay? This is, yeah, it's very simple. So what happens if disorder is relevant, okay? Then you have to follow the flow generated by this operator. So take, a CF, take your favorite CFT, everybody picture their favorite CFT, take your favorite operator in that CFT, and add a disordered coupling to it, okay? Suppose the operator that you choose had a dimension below this amount, then what you're gonna do is your CFT is gonna start flowing with this disordered coupling, all right? So where does it go? So this is a very difficult problem in quantum field theory, okay? So let me tell you some things that are known in the sort of conventional quantum field theory language. So the simplest quantum field theory might, I, know, I'm, I could be in one plus one actually. So let's, be, let's imagine above one plus one. So then we have our Wilson-Fisher, the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. So what happens if you take the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, take a mass term, phi squared, and add a disordered mass term, okay? This is a question that's been studied, was studied in the 80s. Um, so, well, it depends. So if you're doing, if you're a statistical physicist, so you're not doing quantum field theory, you're imagining there's some finite temperature phase transition, you have Euclidean theory, and you want to look at the effects of disorder on that, then the disorder is in all directions, there's no time, right? Everything is Euclidean. In that case, it turns out that within an epsilon expansion, you find that this disorder drives the theory to a new IR fixed point where the, this disordered coupling is, 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 is non-zero, and you have an IR disordered fixed point, okay? Morally, rather similar to just a normal fixed point, okay? However, in the quantum critical model, meaning that it's only space that's disordered, it's quenched disorder, the disorder is perfectly correlated in time, it has no time dependence, then it turns out if you do an epsilon expansion, you will not find a fixed point, okay? And the disorder just wants to flow and not stop flowing. And that, that is a very difficult, like where does it go? Uh, it's a tricky, a tricky problem. So there are some, so and it's it gets more interesting. Um, in, in one plus one dimensions, there are various solvable models, including some solved by, by Matthew's brother, which actually show that there are these infinite, so for example, take the Ising model in a transverse field, one dimension, and then just take the couplings between neighboring spins to be, to be drawn from some random distribution. You can actually solve that, and uh, in the IR, you find these infinite disorder fixed point. Very funny things happen. So for example, the couplings, the couplings don't satisfy 
nice beta function equations. It's the logarithms of the couplings that satisfy nice. So, so where, where things happen, and you get something called activated scaling, where the energy doesn't go like a power of the momentum. It goes even more, much more weakly. Okay. So for people who have known and cared about these things in the last few years, it's, it's, a, it's morally as equals infinity. Okay. It goes so z is like you know omega. Omega goes like k to the z. Okay. So it's it's weaker than 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 any power. Right. Okay. So. What we might well ask, what, what does holography have anything to say? What happens if you perturb CFTs with holographic duels by, by disorder? Um, so I should add that several people have thought about this, including Alan Adams has, and Shoya Aida have some papers that are sort of precursors to what I'm about to tell you about. So, okay, how do you model a random coupling for a start? So there are actually various ways of modeling random couplings. One thing that you can show is that if you have a sum of cosines, where the, the frequencies are evenly spaced, but the periods are random, but random phase shifts, uh, and the limit at n, where n's the number of cosines goes to infinity, you can prove that this represents a Gaussian random coupling. Okay. So we want to add some. We're going to take uh, Einstein's scalar field. We're going to take gravity, add a scalar field, and make that scalar field have a coupling, which is one of these these random things. Now, because it's a bit scary, and as you've seen, these relevant disorder can really do, do drastic things, we wanted to start with the simplest case, which is a marginally relevant uh, disorder. Okay? So you take a coupling that exactly saturates this Harris criterion, this bound. Okay? So it turns out that, it, as in fact uh, Adam and Sho had shown, that it, it's marginally relevant. And so as you start moving in, the disorder starts getting logarithmically, logarithmically bigger. So what we did is something uh, possibly not totally justified. So optimistically, we just resum these logarithms and put them into a power, right? So, you know, the metric. So let's say we start with ADS. So we had like one over z squared, dt squared, dz squared, and then the transverse directions. I don't know if everyone can see that, but this is the only important bit. Okay. There's, there's some metric function here, f of z, that you find by back reacting the disorder on the metric. And it turns out that what you find is that this is of the form 1 plus you know, the strength of the disorder times log z squared, something like that. So for any given dimension, we're going to choose a dimension of the operator to be such that we saturate this bound. Okay? And then you always get logs. Okay? There was a d in this criterion that I wrote. And so the idea is then, with a bit of you know, ho hoping for the best, we're going to resum these logs and get some extra power here. Okay. Now, this doesn't always work. Obviously, in QCD, you can't just resum the logs and you know, be done with it. Okay. So we also, and this is where, well, throughout, I should say, my collaborator George was pretty important, but this is where it was absolutely essential. Uh, so we actually simulated this thing numerically to see if this is true. Okay. So we put this horrible potential on the boundary, and we solve Einstein's PDEs subject to this random potential. So here's here's a picture and a, and a and a metric. So this is a so we're exactly zero temperature. Okay, we're not heating it up. It's quite easy if you heat things up, and then you put some wiggles on the boundary. It's not surprising that the horizon wiggles a little bit. Okay, the question is really go to zero temperature to see if there's a fixed point a, with a scaling symmetry where you have disorder. Okay, that, that's a disordered fixed point. That's what, that's what we're looking for. So this is a cross section of the, this is the scalar field on the on the zero temperature. Let's call it horizon in the in the IR. And so okay, that's a nice picture showing that it's in fact disordered. And then this is the metric that I just wrote here. Okay, in the case of three dimensions, well that that's of this form. Okay, so metrics of this form, following work by uh, Shamed and others, are called Lipschitz metrics. Okay, and this quantity here is called the Lipschitz exponent, or this plus that is called the Lipschitz exponent, which unfortunately is also called z. But that's, that's life. So what we did is we took the numerics, and then we averaged the metric over the, over the disordered directions. Okay? And indeed, um, sorry, this, indeed, we found that the metric has this form. Okay? So actually, this naive resumming of the logs actually seems to, seems to work in this case. Um, and so we could do it. So we have both perturbative results and, and, and numerical results. So here. This is, this is z bar. So this is basically 
the logarithmic derivative of GTT. So if it goes to z to some power, I'll be like one minute. Yeah, time. If it goes to z to some power, this will go to that power. So in the UV at the boundary, we're at one. That's because that's Lorentz invariance. Okay, z equals one is Lorentz invariance. And as you go in, it does something, and then it stabilizes at another power, and that's this emergent Lipschitz symmetry of the average geometry. Okay, so this is a disordered fixed point. It's not relativistic, clearly, because it disorders in space and not time, uh, but it has this, on average, scale invariance. This is now a plot of z, of the exponent, against the strength of the disorder at the boundary. Remember, it's, it's marginal, so we can, we can tune that. And then we see that as v bar grows, this z rapidly starts getting very big. Um, this dashed line, this is our analytic result from doing perturbation theory to fourth order. Okay, it's a non, not a totally trivial calculation. Uh, so we have an analytic result in perturbation theory in V for these exponents. The top line is in general dimension. The bottom line is for a three-dimensional bulk. Where we, that's where we go to fourth order. So this is the numerics, and this is the, uh, you know, this naive, slightly naive resummation. Okay. So this is meant to show that they're unambiguously they seem to, we have strong evidence that there do exist disordered fixed points in holography, which are non-trivial things to come by. And also, Z seems to grow with the disorder strength. So these results suggest that if we're a little braver and we go beyond the marginally relevant case and actually add a fully relevant disorder, that we may flow to a Z equals infinity fixed points. Okay? And this potentially has the potential to tie in with these papers I mentioned by Dan Fisher on the Ising model, where also show that disorder leads to local, z equals infinity is like a local physics, okay? It means space, when z is infinity, it means momentum comes for free, okay? Momentum does not cost you energy, all right? Um, so it would be fantastic if we could make some kind of connection with that. Also, z equals infinity has a slightly magical thing in a holography because extreme or isonotion on black holes have z equals infinity. It makes you wonder if there's some disorder, I'm not sure about that, but there's some disorder interpretation of, of those, okay? So to conclude, um, so I, I started off by defining coherent metals. So these are metals that had a, a slow decay, a decay rate that was parametrically small compared to the UV scale. I told you that if you did not have weak coupling, this was surely a sign that there, was on, there would probably only be one quantity that relaxed slowly, which would be the total momentum. If that happens, that predicts a very dramatic violation of the vitamin Franz law in a very particular way, and this may potentially uh, have been observed in vanadium dioxide. And then finally, I was telling you about when a disorder is relevant, not small, uh, then you can construct uh, finite temperature disordered fixed points in, in holography, which opens up. There's a lot of very exotic disorder physics, which would be fantastic to get a holographic uh, handle on. Okay, thank you. Okay, question for Sean. Back here. Julie. Is there someone who could help with the mic? Or I, I, had a, I had a short question. Oh, okay. Oh, I just missed the very. I just missed the sort of a little bit, but the very last point. What's the significance of averaging the metric? You have this disordered metric, and you replace it with you you average it to get a homogeneous one. The physics of these two metrics is very different. So what's yeah, why do you uh, use this as a measure of of, of the physics uh, of no, the? Yeah, you're not the only one that's asked me that question. So I, I think we still need to understand that. You would hope, although it's not. It's a question of what quantities are self-averaging with this order, okay, yeah. which we don't know the answer to right now. However, if um, you might hope that this Z, for example, that if you heat the solution up, which we haven't done yet, the entropy will go like T to the 2 over Z, mm -hmm. which, would be a, which would be a dimension analysis. So if the entropy is self-averaging in this disorder ensemble, then the Z would tell you things like how the entropy scales. But we haven't shown that that, that happens. Question? Um, so how hard is to calculate entanglement and entropy and check that the usual, so because yeah. that's been that's when we diagnose uh, even Localize at it. even at zero temperature, it's a way to diagnose whether. Yeah, that's have uh, an excellent question. So, um, yeah, and I guess you'd like to do that not in the average metric, but in the actual the actual disordered thing. Um, um, yeah, I haven't. I, I, it should be do. I mean, okay, perturbative in disorder. I mean, we have the solution. And so probably one can uh, one can think about it, but it's a great question. Yeah, obviously. I, I should fi we finished this, you know, a few weeks ago, and there are a lot of things that we want to do. But yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? So is vanadium dioxide the only material that you? 
Ah, good. Think <laughs> that, uh, so, okay, so, it gets, so what do I want? You need, see, you need the intersection of, of two things that are not trivial. That they, someone needs to measure the optical conductivity and someone needs to measure the thermal conductivity. Okay. Um, and the optical conductivity needs to have a Judah peak. So let, what do we have? So the cuprates are complicated for two reasons, cuprates being high temperature superconductors, that the, um, in much of the interesting range, the optical conductivity doesn't show a clear Judah peak. It's a, what they would call an incoherent metal. So for, for the cuprates, this is probably not the right framework to think about the conductivity. And then secondly, even if you did want to, then you have to measure the thermal conductivity, which involves taking out this phonon contribution. Okay, so there's actually a very clever thing. There's one paper on this um, on experimentally on the cuprates, and at, at, at there's several papers at very very low temperatures, but that's not where I want to be. I want to be in this linear and T regime, and actually they do a very clever thing. They apply a magnetic field and they measure the ratio of Hall conductivities because the phonon the phonons are neutral and they don't couple to the uh, to the whole current, so this directly gives you the <laughs> electron contribution. And so in that, but there's only one paper, so, but so this Lorentz ratio is small-ish, but not tiny, you know, it's like 0 0.3, so. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I think a non-trivial thing is you have to be able to measure the thermal conductivity well. And the reason it works with this metal insulator transition is, is pretty nice, actually. So you, you at low temperatures, it, it's just insulating. So the, the, the electrical conductivity it's just it's just zero, and then it suddenly jumps at the at the metal insulator transition, and so you know that the thermal conductivity in the insulating phase is exclusively due to phonons because the electrons are not moving, right? And so then, if you can convince yourself that immediately after the jump, the phonon contribution doesn't change significantly, which, if it's all about Mott's electronic physics, you might hope is true, then basically you just subtract you can subtract the phonon contribution because it doesn't change across the metal insulator transition. So you, know, you need these special things to happen to have a chance of measuring the uh, heat conductivity properly. But indeed, I think this is a motivation that people should try harder to, um, yeah, to do that. So I, sorry, so I don't know of any other material that satisfies the criteria that you need to satisfy. Anyone else? Okay, well, let's thank Sean again. And uh, next, I guess there is an announcement uh, from Eva and, and, Dave. Oh, and Dave. And Gary, so there's quite a few. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why don't you? So as some of you know, uh, we've... Uh, Eva and Don Maroff, who's not here this afternoon, and I have been organizing a fundraising effort to try to found something called the Joe and Dorothy Pulchinski Fellowship, which will be used to support uh, a UCSB graduate student in their studies. Um, and we did preliminary fundraising to try to kick it off. This is what the fundraisers always tell you to do, to sort of have the silent part of the campaign before the public part of the campaign. And uh, um, the goal is to, to raise a $100,000 endowment, and I'm happy to say that we're more than halfway there in the silent part of the campaign. But we are encouraging anyone who would like to join in this effort to do so. And were you going to tell us something about how to do that? Well, I think everybody got the yeah, email, I think, I think and there's, a, there's an online link to do it. Um, it's also a little bit more efficient if you do it by check, as it happens. But um, it, it is Efficient easy. in that the credit card company doesn't get their cut. <laughs> okay, so you should you should so full disclosure there, but it's very easy to do. So uh, and there's already been a, an enthusiastic response, but uh, good. So that was the first announcement. So I see Jesse back there. Um, the next thing we would like to do, and Kevin and I don't see Craig, but uh, the next thing we would, oh hello. So the next thing we would like to do is thank the the KITP staff for this uh, amazing event. As usual, they are the de facto organizers of the whole thing and, you know, did an amazing job. So at first, it was kind of like planning a wedding. In fact, we were going to mimic Don's wedding downtown. <laughs> <laughs> he had it all laid out. But uh, fortunately, the KITP stepped up, and we all made the executive decision not to glom it on to the field theory conference that just happened. And so 
it was a, you know, a whole extra event that the staff uh, enthusiastically organized. And so we're incredibly grateful for that. So thank you all so much for. Okay, I actually wanted to wait till the end to thank the organizers, uh, just to see how good the last talk was. <laughs> um, but I'd like to, I'd like to thank um, Don and Eva and, and George and Rob for putting together a very creative schedule uh, that, that really has led, led to an exciting two days. You know, genuinely, initially, I, I said, no, I don't want to do this, um, but, but once, uh, I saw the plan, and once I saw how almost every single person who I would like to see was actually going to be here, um, I, I um, became more and more excited. And for those of you, I know there are several in the audience who are nearing the age of, of, of whatever it is and, um, and are wondering whether or not they want to do this, um, I, I definitely recommend it. Uh, um, but anyway, anyway, I just want to thank you all for taking the trouble to make the trip here. But even more, you know, these two days have been a nice chance to, to recall the last 40 years of my career and to realize how much, um, you know, I've benefited from my interactions with each and every one of you. So I'd just like to thank all of you for, you know, having, um, having contributed to such a, a wonderful lifelong experience and one which is still going on. So thank you. <laughs>